Good afternoon. Hello, welcome. I'm, uh, my name is Mike Murawski. I'm Director of Education and Public Programs here at the Portland Art Museum. And I could not be more thrilled to welcome you all today to today's talk and conversation with Philip Yenowen. We're going to begin this afternoon's program with Philip presenting and speaking about and engaging us in the inquiry-based teaching method he's worked to develop and research for 30 years, more than 30 years, or around 30 years now, um, called Visual Thinking Strategies. Following that, I'll be joining Philip on stage, and we'll have a little bit of a conversation about some of the implications um, and, and questions that this uh, that comes up for this teaching strategy within the museum context, um, but also anything that comes up during the conversation too. Um, so I'm interested to, to be able to lead that. And then we'll make sure that we have time for Q&A. So if you have any questions during any part of uh, today's program, uh, feel free to, to sort of hold on to those. And then we'll make sure we've got an open Q&A time um, at the end of the program today. Uh, but first, I want to thank uh, two, especially two people that are here. Um, to sort of making this partnership and this program happen today here at the museum. Uh, one is uh, Erica Serra, who's the manager of training and partnerships for the National Visual Understanding and Education Office. Um, Erica, working with Philip, was able to sort of get the Portland Art Museum on Philip's um, speaking tour that he's had. He was in Eugene um, until yesterday and was able to go down there and see him speak there. And then um, huge thanks to Kim Aziz, regional manager for the Visual Understanding and Education Office. Um, and Kim is here. Thank you you so much, Kim, for helping us um, be a part of this and to make this happen. Kim has worked so hard to get and support VTS here in the Pacific Northwest and especially here in Portland. Um, the Portland Art Museum is one of seven art museums in Oregon and Washington that are partnering with VTS and bringing these teaching strategies into the schools and bringing students to these institutions to strengthen visual literacy and arts education. And before I hand it over to Philip, I wanted to provide a brief introduction. I never like to go on and on, um, but I wanted to go on a little bit. I always try to embarrass guest speakers just a tiny bit. Um, uh, so Philip Yanuin is the co-founder, along with cognitive psychologist Abigail Hausen, of Visual Thinking Strategies, as well as co-founder of Visual Understanding and Education, a nonprofit educational research organization that develops and studies ways uh, ways of teaching visual literacy and of using art to teach thinking and communication skills. Philip has such an incredible depth of experience in museums for 40 years. Um, and I, I will not list all of them, Philip, but um, one of his um, early important positions in a museum was at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, working for high school programs as a museum educator in charge in those programs, and did some really interesting experimental education work there that educators today still look back to and are inspired by. <clears throat> he was director of education at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, founding director of the Aspen Art Museum, director of education for many years at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and more recently consulting curator for the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston. Philip is the author of An Introduction to Modern Art that's called How to Look at Modern Art. He is also the author of six children's books, my favorite being How to Show Grownups the Museum, A Young Person's Guide to the Museum of Modern Art. And his most recent book, which is um, one of the reasons he's been take, traveling around the country speaking, uh, is Visual Thinking Strategies, Using Art to Deepen Learning Across School Disciplines. His research and practice, without a doubt, has and continues to have a profound and lasting impact on art education and museum learning. And in ways that art museums can trust what visitors see, think, and bring to our conversations with art. So please join me in welcoming Philip Yenowen. Thank you. That was nice. <laughs> the older you get, the longer the introductions. It's sort of <clears throat> but anyway, it's really great to be in Portland. This museum I haven't been in for a very, very long time, and it's bigger and more beautiful than ever. And of course, um, this, these, this moment in um, our year to be in Oregon, in Portland, is sort of, wow, <laughs> so beautiful. And, but Mike is doing really remarkable work, not only here, but um, in museum education generally. And it's sort of, it's fun to be, <laughs> having been part of the old guard, to be sort of um, in connection, deep connection, sort of with people who are taking over this field in, in really interesting and productive ways. Um, 
And it's great, of course, to be here with Kim and her associate Mirka, who are doing a lot of work with BTS here. And, and uh, I got off my, the start to my time in Portland yesterday at the Laurelhurst School. And I will be coming back to this, but <clears throat> wow. It's like BTS, it's okay. It's a good thing. Just, what teachers have, are learning about kids <laughs> through the process of letting them explore stuff on their own, with, structured by the teacher, but doing the discoveries and conversing about them um, it, it is, I believe, once it gets known, is going to tell us a great deal more about the potential of young people uh, and what they can do in school, things like that. Sort of, people are sort of wondering about whether or not <clears throat> they can reach the common core standards. Well, if they can't, it's because of the grown-ups' problems, <laughs> not because of the kids. <laughs> All right, great. <laughs> So we're, I think we're on the same page here. <laughs> All right, so this talk is sort of, um, I mean, I want to sort of, get, get in the, not the beginning so much of a BTS, but the sort of the notion of, of the arts as having a role in life kind of thing, because it's, it's um, one of the basic questions that, um, that I think most people who care about art and want to try to have it connect to schools come up against, whether it's expressed comment or just implicit kind of thing is like, really? You want to use art for something serious? Um, art is so tangential, for the most part, in our culture, so marginalized, the arts. Um, it's, we're, we put them in boxes. You have most of the arts in museums, or maybe galleries. Um, they, they're concert boxes of all sorts. There's, so the arts are, are in so many ways sort of segmented off and kept in what seem like private reserves, and often in spaces that are intimidating to go to and for which it's often expensive to go. And there are lots of ways in which that sort of plays out. But it's dreadfully unfortunate, it seems to me, because if you just glance at this rather odd collection of images on this one slide, you realize that sort of over time, um, art has had um, a, a lot of roles, but most of them have been integral to the communities that made them. And so we have up there on the upper left something that people even don't even know what it's for. <laughs> um, from Minoa, from something called a cyclotic figure. But it's sort of interesting that, that it sort of uh, made its way to modern times, I think in part because it was considered special and precious in its own time, but also because we um, recognize in it sort of a certain kind of sub beauty. <laughs> it's such a simplified, idealized uh, convention. Sort of, we guess that maybe because of the enlarged hips that this might have something to maybe belly um, might have something to do with fertility. But sort of, but but it's but the point is that it was considered important enough that it didn't get lost in time. It it would it somehow made it in some circumstance where we could find it again, even if it was lost in for a period of time, kind of thing. And so it had some kind of key role. At another point in time in ancient Egypt, sort of the art, um, as far as we know, because you, there isn't much that it dealt with sort of way, the way ordinary people left, was enormously important in sort of helping the royalty get to their afterlife in, in safety and in, with the um, uh, assurance that it was going to be a, a good experience for them. But sort of these kinds of things were, you know, um, this was this is from Tut's tomb, sort of the bottom back of a throne, um, but it was um, essential uh, if if not shared by the community at large, considered so important that it would that rather major tombs were created like the pyramids to sort of keep um, these things and protect their their. But the importance <laughs> major, um, sort of in some cultures. Uh, it may be hermetic to some degree. In other words, sort of in a tri within a tribal uh, society, sort of uh, the, the whatever is um, the, the, the way they the way they believe, the way what they believe, how they address what they believe, how they communicate with their gods and their spirits, how they understand who they are, maybe more in a way narrowly focused than 
would be true of something like this, which is a, um, an object lesson within Christianity, which tells sort of two stories, the origin, sorry, the creation myth, and then the expulsion from the Garden of Eden. But in, in each case, what we do know is that they provided key roles in helping people meet, reach their gods, understand who they were, um, and become part of the greater picture of being a people kind of thing. They had roles in the community, they had roles with the individual, uh, and, and their pursuit of understanding of this life that we lead and perhaps the life beyond and so on and so forth. So, um, and then we have things that sort of have, whereas this has a collective meaning across Christianity, it might have been more easy to read at one moment in time than it is maybe presently, but the fact is that sort of we have the, you know, the, the Buddha figure, this one being from Thailand, something that sort of serves huge numbers of people with the same reference point. And, and again, it's a spiritual one. Sort of as far as I'm concerned, that there's a really basic reason why the arts, and I don't mean just the visual arts, even though this is a presentation about them, them um, the arts sort of have had, I think, a critical relationship with religion over time, which is that, that it's these things that make you think but also give you the opportunity to feel that at the same time, that when you actually penetrate those two things together and think of how that's possible within the, within the architecture of a, of a Gothic cathedral where you not only have architecture, stained glass windows, sculpture, you have the possibility of music, you have liturgy, you have sacrament, but you do with this too, you have ritual and other kinds of things that sort of bring these things to sort of life in a bigger sort of sense. It's when you're playing with, helping people play with ideas and with things that sort of have a, an emotional connection that you feed spirit. I think there's something really key in that and that's why the arts have had such a symbiotic and long-term relationship with religions. But life is a little different now. And not saying that there isn't a lot of religion around, <laughs> but it's not, but we, but we are, our world is global and our view is not homogeneous. It's much more um, broad, what, broad you know, broad based than that. And we have, yet we have all sorts of things that are brought together in museums and <clears throat> allow us the opportunity to sort of experience them to some degree. Um, but at this point, sort of, we have things that sort of, this is in here as a, as a kind of stand-in for all things decorative, um, because there's a huge tradition, of course, in all cultures of making beautiful things that sort of make life more pleasant. But this is, happens to be um, a bowl that was created for a Japanese um, Buddhist tea ceremony, um, an object of a con uh, contemplation at a very, very refined level kind of thing, sort of the notion of being able to stare at this for a long period of time and see it, it and, and, and read the aesthetic implications of it is, is sort of something that requires almost a particular kind of headset. We, with something like this, we have you know, um, Rembrandt allowing us access to the feelings of old age. Although I did it sort of, I keep forgetting to check the date when this was in terms of his life, but I think he was younger than me when he made this picture. And yet, <laughs> I'm not quite that tired yet. But in any case, sort of a combination of sort of how he describes himself and the use of dark as well as light and the kind of thing, what he's chosen to put in the background, what he's chosen to sort of have in there, like his palette and his brushes, but how um, minimal they are by comparison to how bright they could be, how much more dominant they could be kind of thing. It allows us to sort of focus on this face and sort of um, to the extent that we want to spend time with it, sort of we can find it a meditation on age and a meditation on the wages of life um, and, and so on and so forth. And, and here, we have, in a tradition of history painting, painting that tried to tell the stories, has tried to relate the stories from myths, from the Bible and things like that. We have a historical event, sort of, but as told by Goya, it's not so much about, um, you know, I think it was Napoleon's army sort of in Spain that did this. Does anybody know? It is. It is, thank you. <laughs> um, and, and by the way, it was the 5th of May that Dose? Second of May. Really close. Is that tomorrow? Yes. 
So there we have, but, but we have, we have you know, sort of an army represented sort of with its set of guns. We have a set of, of people who are being shot at, who are being massacred kind of thing. And um, so this is a historical event, but what's told in it is the capacity humans have for uh, close range violence. And um, despite the fact that sort of someone might be imploring for his life, others sort of frightened about the death that they seem coming, some people actually in the scene already gone, someone praying for them all. Um, th 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 this picture sort of just isn't just a historical event, but it is a representation of something that if you spend time with it, and if you think about it, can, can bring you to what Gora, Goya referred to as the horrors of war. And then you know, jumping to sort of something completely different kind of thing, we have um, the sort of explorations that artists of the 20th century began doing um, which are entirely abstract, but which may very much sort of express uh, a concept very big in the 20th century of make it new, <laughs> find, uh, invent, always make innovation being a, an absolutely important thing. So don't do anything anybody else has ever done. So find your own way. But then also make it a signature style, make it be individualistic, make it be you, not just not like anybody else kind of thing. But also it might be the kind of thing that, um, that given the studies of psychology that had sort of built over the course of the 20th century, allowed uh, artists sort of a, a access to kind of trying to either act in an automatic way that might come from the subconscious or in some way represent subconscious thought, not thought that was attached necessarily to sort of anything concrete in the way that, say, even a dream might be concrete kind of thing. It also might be the kind of thing that, um, that if this is dealing with a kind of one way of representing uh, something that's really hard to express, <laughs> um, that moment when you're standing and a gun is pointing at you, <laughs> and you're not alone, and you know you're going to die, and you know they're not going to listen. I mean, so, but at, right after the atomic bomb had been used in two instances in Japan, um, what an artist might, in fact, find um, as a way of trying to express what he thought about that or felt about that kind of thing. I, I don't know if, I don't think that's what Picasso was, I'm sorry, 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 I, Jackson Pollock was necessarily thinking, nobody does. But the fact is that sort of it's possible to read into it that kind of, of the notion of something that a horror that's so big and so impersonal and so generalized the capacity of a bomb to take the, the weapon of mass destruction, the original one, um, that, that it sort of requires a different kind of representation. So we, we have art still working in the, our contemporary culture, um, but who did Jackson Pollock make this for? You and me? Well, maybe. I mean, I don't think he didn't want us to see it, but he made it for the art world. He made it for museums. He made it for his fellow artists. He made it for his little clique of people. Now, I don't, I'm not trying to say that he was just sort of egocentric about this whole thing. I sort of, but the fact is that by the time Pollock made this, artists were working in, all, in that sacred preserve of the arts that could make it so that who is art for now? And what, art, what purpose does it serve? And maybe this is a question for an individual to answer, but it's also bigger than that because we live in a global culture. And sort of what purpose could the arts use traditionally to sort of help people understand the unfathomable, learn to help people reach their spiritual truths, understand the processes of change and life and connections and the lack of them and things like death sort of, we're all still grappling with those issues, but in a way, in, an abs in the absence of an expression that we all can turn to, to help us get there, and I don't mean, again, just the visual, because most of the practices of the past were combined, sacrament, language, um, movement, of course, music. The arts may very well have a special place for most of us in this room, or you wouldn't be here. But what would it take for us to reposition the arts 
in such a way that they actually become that kind of link between us and something hugely important. So, <laughs> class. <laughs> In a way, this is the beginning. I'm going to give you some insight into my answer to that question. It's called visual thinking strategies. And it was created in response to the fact that sort of visitors at the Museum of Modern Art and other places I had worked wanted assistance with, with their looking. <clears throat> they were not content that they understood enough of what was being presented to them. This didn't, wasn't limited to new things. It was also true to some degree about old things in museums. But people wanted assistance. And when we were provided it at MoMA, we found out through a very copious research process that despite the fact that our, our um, programs were very popular, they got a great evaluations, people attended them, they, they all felt like they were in the palm of our very, my very talented staff's hands, sort of people weren't walking away knowing any more than when they came in. They weren't, we had not assisted them to become self-sufficient viewers, they still needed us to make the encounters as rich as they wanted them to be. It was very disappointing to me, because as you see, I don't think art is inconsequential. I think we need it. I think we need it like we need sleep and love. I think we cannot live with the arts at a in the periphery. I think it's one of the reasons why we have so many struggles in the world today, that what the arts do for us isn't happening. So, wanting to try to do something about that, Really, it was a museum-based program, wanting people to get more meaning and pleasure from works of art, as I had somehow learned to do. Uh, we went to work, Abigail Hausen and I just sort of created something called Visual Thinking Strategies. It was, it's a long story how it came about, and it used a lot of very deep and searching data that Hausen had about how people think when they look at works of art, a subject of its own merit at some point, but we're not gonna try to go into that during our little time today. But I hope I haven't used up too much of my time already. Um, this is VTS, Visual Thinking Strategies. I have chosen a picture for you. You might recognize it. <laughs> but I want you to look at it in a way that maybe it's hard to do when you're walking up and down a set of stairs. Now let's talk about it. What's going on in this picture? Yes. What's his say, say it again. You talking about him, his? Okay, good. So, are you calling him the painter? And what did you see that made you think it was his palette? Good. It's a team effort. And so the paint on his pants, this guy's a painter. He set down his palette. All right, good. What more can you find? Thank you. Yes. And what did you see that made you say distracted from his work? So, and what did you see that made you know he's looking at her? Very good. So there's something about his expression that makes one, you convinced that he's sort of gazing backwards, distracted perhaps from his work, um, but that, and that, that he's somewhat surprised at what he sees. Okay, good. What more can you find? <laughs> so he has, when you say he's painting a Matisse, Okay, good. So his, his inspiration comes from another artist, Henri Matisse, okay? What did you see that made you say that? Uh, okay, good. And it, an example of the highest kind of art kind of thing, the art that museums appreciate. All right, so you're talking about a specific painting that sort of um, is much admired in the canon of 20th century art, sort of, and it involves some figures dancing by Matisse. Okay, good. What more can you find? Yes. For me, he's looking out at us, the viewer. It's like he's, he's asking us to consider in a different way, maybe the subject. And consider it in a different way and also the source of interpretation. 
All right, so another interpretation of his look, that he's not looking at her and surprised by what he sees, but instead looking out at us and maybe inviting us to... Or challenging us. Challenging us. Um, t in what way? To see uh, his vision. She feels like she's, the, she's somewhat a model or subject, and he's offering this interpretation of that. All right, so... And what did you see that made you think that she might be the model? Just the references to nudity, the fact that she's in his studio while he's painting, um, that she's not facing us. She's not uh, like, it feels like he's, he's more in, the one in control here. OK, good. So, so because of her juxtaposition, because she seems to be semi-naked kind of thing, thinking that she might be the model. And if that's the case, then maybe what he's asking us to do is sort of think about a reinterpretation yeah. of the human figure kind of thing in his, paint, his, his or whoever's painting this is. <laughs> OK, good. What more can we find? Way in the back? Uh, and then? This one? Oh, I see. All right, great. So, so um, you think that, that actually a third interpretation of what he might be looking at, which is. So she has a real job. She's not just a passive model for this kind of thing. Did you say the word hussy? <laughs> so now what did you see that made you use that term? All right, good, good. So she doesn't seem to be a totally sort of, you know, paid model kind of situation. Sort of, there's a little bit more information here. There's the high heels. There seems like to be the seams in the stockings. So the, the whole idea of her being sort of slightly other than just an artist model, whatever just might mean in that case. But okay, so but in any case, that he might be checking checking her out in order to sort of get the flesh tone more accurate, and you sort of see something that looks more like her flesh tone. Right here. All right, good. What more can we find? You were next. All right, so um, your eyes are drawn to something you wouldn't necessarily expect to be have, have called your attention kind of thing. It's a pair of OK, you might expect it to sort of be a little bit less conspicuous kind of thing. But, but the fact that it isn't, and it drew, you, drew your attention, you began to wonder sort of about the checkerboard and think maybe about a game kind of thing. OK, good. What more can we find? Yes, and then. Well, and then. OK, so, but you're talking about specifically this palette. Are you seeing the black and white anywhere else? Uh, Cole Scott and the line. Oh, OK. <laughs> oh, um, OK, so, so um, you're identifying this particular, this person as a, a Cole Scott. And what did you see that made you say Cole Scott? OK, good. So you're familiar with this painting. You're not, so if someone's familiar with this painting, meaning in linking it to Matisse, you're looking at him and, and more and thinking this is, by, this is the artist himself, and his name is Robert Colescott. And he is uh, often very concerned about the relationships between black and white, and that perhaps the, the, this black and white checkerboard might be a reference to 
that dichotomy and that also with her you're, you're saying as a white person and him as a black person, that also might be a way of drawing attention to the, to racial difference. <laughs> oh, come on. I did not. Okay, good. What more can we find? I forget where we were. Yes. So she's not, she, there's nothing, I mean, this is a, a negotiation that's ending badly. <laughs> so he may be making a last ditch attempt to sort of match her skin color, but it didn't take with her. I'm out of here. Okay, good. I'm working with you. You were next, I think, actually. And then. That, okay, good. So that since it, the overall thing seems to be sort of ambiguous, and sort of so this, the. So so there there it's in terms of content, it's like there's it's a little bit obscure, but also in terms of actually visually, it there's very there's a lot of it that's not as. Um, uh, easily separated from, the, from its environment, sort of there's not so much figure ground differentiation as there is here sort of thing. So again, it sort of calls attention to that and maybe gives more meaning, heavier meaning to that, or heavy meaning. Okay, so, all right, so the, the whole notion of sort of what the relationship here is being ambiguous and, um, and the power, that, that sort of it's an interesting thing to think about sort of the, the, the way this figure has a certain kind of power. I mean, we, even when calling her a hussy, you sort of think that this is not a, you know, a passive character kind of thing, but you also think of the artist as being the one in control in a studio kind of thing, and then you also sort of realize that sort of these figures have a certain kind of power. So. The notion of power being an underlying theme here might be sort of something to sort of um, to think about. Okay, good. Now, I didn't connect your first, blah, 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 but anyway. Uh, one or two more thoughts, I'm afraid. That's all we'll have time for. Yes, sir. Okay, good. So if you were, you were playing with that idea in terms of the black and white and sort of knowing something about Colescott that he is, that's an issue to him, but you're sort of seeing it in the picture kind of thing that sort of, if this is an icon of, of um, modern art kind of thing, made by a white man kind of thing, sort of having been, uh, having a black artist sort of um, appropriate it and, and change the color of the people in it has, is a power statement all in its own kind of thing. Is that what, Okay, good. One more thought? Yes. Um, are you seeing a certain, uh, so, okay, having noticed in real life, <laughs> where you can actually see this, see this and read what this says in the actual painting, a good argument for spending time with the actual painting, which you can do on your way out of here very easily, um, there, it says, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And given the conditioning of Americans to what beauty is kind of thing, it drew your attention to this figure. And I'm not sure exactly how she ended up in the beauty scale. Okay, great.
All right, good. So we have possibility of racial uh, implications for this. We've discussed in sort of several ways kind of thing, but also gender issues kind of thing in the construction of female identity and sort of so on and so forth. So with the, with the notion of beauty brought up in this little comment down here, um, it just makes you think about sort of that in relationship to sort of women, and there is more than one woman represented in this picture, okay? You did a fantastic job. <laughs> <laughs> and <clears throat> we have 10 minutes for the rest of this talk. <laughs> so, moving right along. Um, what did this ask of you as viewers? To look closely, to describe? Cite Pardon? Cite to, to provide evidence to back up opinions? To Listen to each other? Try to make connections between ideas and between ideas in the picture? Yeah. Right. All right, so to spend the time looking that is required for aesthetic growth to occur, but for actually for serious thought about practically anything. We sort of let so much stuff go boop, pass over us kind of thing, and you know, we almost have to because there's so much visual material in the culture, so many sounds. We have to let some of it just pass us by. But if we want to gain something from it, we have to spend time, and you did. And what you spent time doing was more than looking, it was thinking, and it was sharing ideas verbally. It was articulating those ideas. So when kids do this in school, you know, over the course of years, we now have VTS that begins in pre pre-K and runs through, you know, not, it's not finished in middle and high school, but we still have beginnings of that. Our, our core curriculum goes through elementary school kind of thing. And in the grades three to five, kids begin with images like this, sort of making sense uh, in the course of one lesson of three, oops, <laughs> three pictures. I'm just going to walk over here and point. Um, sort of so one kind of visual depiction system, very narrative, with some elements in it that are, with lots of elements that are recognizable, but also things that are, are like, what's he thinking? And in today's world, what's that? <laughs> or what's that? And what's that? And what is that? I'll wonder. And who are those people? And what's going on? What's wrong with her? So there's stuff to, to puzzle over, to talk about, but it's fairly easy to sort of get into it. A little less easy to sort of see this in part because in part the background is sort of distant and obscured kind of thing. And also just the, 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 the interaction between these two people is not completely clear. And like, where's the electricity, by the way, for those electric guitars? And over here, the third picture of the first lesson has much less information in a narrative sense, much more quiet, uh, much more possibility in what you're sort of seeing and reading in the background, and uh, so on and so forth, so that, so that the whole business of finding meaning in these, building on observations kinds of things, it becomes complex even in the sequence of three images. Over the course of the 10, uh, well, nine lessons in the classroom and one museum visit, ideally, kids will get a, a whole range of pictures, each with this different set of combinations of familiar and unfamiliar material and a variety of cultures represented, a variety of visual systems. We want, by the time they're finished with it, this, these are the images that come in lesson nine, that they feel conversant with and flexible enough to sort of approach lots of different kinds of visual systems and probe them for meaning, even if the meaning is a little bit obscure. Now, I could tell you more about why this image set of images was selected. And for those of you who are in art education, it might be interesting that sort of the first formal element that starts appearing as a natural evolution of the process of looking at images this way is the interest in space. It's not color line and shape. They rarely come up, almost never really. But the whole business of sort of trying to probe space and sort of things. So we give them pictures. We don't change the questions. There's the questions of ETS are, what's going on in this picture? What do you see that makes you say that? Asked when everything, it, something is not explained, but, um, but we're requiring evidence. And what more can we find? That's the, it's, teachers are asked to stick to those three questions and to the process of listening to what people say and paraphrasing what they say, as I was doing with you, 
um, and, and obviously being able to sort of say it much more clearly than he did. Um, <laughs> but, but that's, in a way, what's in it for teachers, is the fun you have in trying to develop your own language, to find richness in your own vocabulary, and then in, and model that. You're not correcting kids. You're just showing how something can be said grammatically. They have wonderful ideas. You're helping them express them. So they don't feel corrected. They, and it's you know, lots of benefits. In any case, sort of these, this, these pictures get, uh, get, give them the opportunity to explore that formal interest they're interested in, in addition to the subject matter and the content and the meaning in them kind of thing. Um, the, the, the BTS is a strategy for making meaning grounded in evidence, very importantly involving peer interactions. We begin with art because of what art brings to the table, which is ambiguity, um, plenty to start with, plenty to puzzle. Um, the, the, there's a range of visual vocabularies that is used that sort of allows over time for people to become comfortable with looking at, at all kinds of different visual systems sort of things. But that combination of recognizability and ambiguity is very important for sort of making a topic of interest to be discussed. But it can be, the strategy can be applied to other topics of interest, as long as they are within reach. So don't ask me about rocket science. Um, but you can ask me about light and shade. Um, you know what I mean? Um, ideally open-ended. And they can use the experience of discussions with works of art and other kinds of subject matter to build to other lessons that require other kinds of cognitive operations, such as looking up, becoming curious, developing questions, looking for answers. What we find is that sort of based on the strengths that both the teacher has and the kids have from the image ex discussions, they can apply that to a very art-like photo document of a certain time that brings up a lot of different sort of issues. But let's say this is in a social, social this is used in a social studies context instead of the more open-ended kind of discussion that a, a straightforward VTS allows. But it builds on the strengths kids have to, communi to communicate with each other, to communicate their ideas, to argue in evidence, and so on and so forth. The first steps of being able to read a primary document, which is the way historians create history, or to D BTS, the poem. What's going on in this poem? What, re what did you read? What words did you read? What line did you read that makes you say that? What more can you find? I chose this poem to show you because this is a, a sixth grade teacher um, in Northern California sort of has a poem a day kind of conversations. And this is one of the poems that she has her sixth graders looking at. It's not an unsophisticated po poem if you just scan it. And yet they find meaning in it, and they argue it in evidence, and so on. Uh, I am um, a pacifist, let's say. And um, I, I just hate war. I just hate everything to do with it. I just think it's just the stupidest way to solve problems. It just doesn't, it, blah, blah, blah. Um, what's interesting is that BTSing, this rather famous address by President Lincoln at Gettysburg, made me realize, just from the first few lines, that there might be causes worth fighting for. And that was important for me. <laughs> I don't know how you feel about it. But the fact is that sort of digging down into this thing that we all know and all recognize but haven't really thought about, very profound. Science. I set to grab these pictures from the New York Times one day. Try to figure out what's going on in these pictures. What do they tell you? The way a scientist looks at data, makes observations, tries to draw conclusions from those observations, argue them in evidence, and then turn to another source, in this case, the caption that was under the picture, to explain it. And in a classroom, moving from the image and image discussions to text is an important way to sort of begin to build the notion of how they work together and how explorations on any level, whether it's just the visual or just the text, is incomplete. 
It's when you put the two together that you begin to sort of move. We have discovered that a lot of thinking skills develop as a result of VTS. Now, basically, we're talking about three questions asked of three pictures nine times a year. Luckily, if there's a museum visit, it's the tenth time. Sometimes used in other lessons, and very wonderfully when that's the case. It's made for a wonderful effect when that's the case kind of thing. What kids have learned to do is make observations, many more observations than when they start, more complicated, more detailed observations, and they start seeing things in combinations. Just think for a moment. If you have a single, simple observation, there's a guy, there's a man. What if, what if you start seeing that man in greater detail? There's a man who's wearing a, a hat and shorts. Think of what the implications for language that that more complicated observation has. They needed more words. They needed descriptive words. When they start seeing things in combination, there's a man, and he's wearing a hat and shorts. And from the look of that tree, I think it's summer. Sentences, a compound sentence, in fact. So the mere building of the capacity to make observations drives language. And it's the first thing we see happen, and it happens in every child. Inferring meaning from those observations. What's going on in this picture asks for you to pull meaning from those observations. And they start to do that very quickly and very early on. And so they, so they learn to draw meaning from the observations. And with the question, what do you see that makes you say that, they learn to provide evidence to back up those inferences. And this carries over it to other lessons. They learn to consider multiple possibilities. You know, it could be this, but it might be that. Can you imagine how that could occur from a conversation that we had? Like, for example, about the, what the meaning of, that, of, of Robert Colescott's glance was, whether he was looking at his model, whether he was looking at us, whether he's looking back to sort of see if he's got the right color. Okay. Revising, elaborating. When applied to math problems in second grade, um, kids who struggle can get to the answers collectively. And then when they turn to do their worksheets, they can show how they've solved the problems. I saw the most wonderful examples of this in the classrooms of Deb Vigna and Jeff Rood yesterday at the Laurelhurst School. I want you, I want you to know <laughs> that in your midst are people who are, I think, would probably consider themselves to be ordinary mortals, but who are um, enabling their children in such a way that the kids aren't mortal anymore. <laughs> they're, just ex they're just their best selves, each of them. It's astonishing to see classrooms instead of the opposite, which we see way too much of. But check it out. These are some of the reasons why it affects change. <laughs> it builds on existing interests. It introduces new but related information items, and so on and so forth. These are all sort of there. Um, I'm going to leave this PowerPoint um, with, with Mike. So if anybody really wants access to this kind of sort of list of information, it's there. But this all connects to that wonderful thing that's sort of uh, being laid on top of schools at this point called Common Core. And I actually am not being ironic when I say I, I, it's wonderful because seeking literacy that goes across disciplines, seeking deep thinking are great things. And again, it's happening in a second grade classroom here because of the way the teachers have taken BTS and built on it. OK. <laughs> Um, VTS allows us to exercise skills that uh, um, we have as soon as we open our eyes as infants. We started making sense. We start making sense of the world with our eyes, and it's an amazing capacity that sort of um, any three-year-old can show you how well they do it. Sort of they, by looking at everything, they're learning so much about the world, kind of thing. And we actually give them language for what it is they see. And that's how that language piece begins to develop based on observations. But it's a skill that school mostly ignores, the skill that every child uses every day outside of school, making sense of what they see. Kids who come from other countries use it even in more than native speakers. 
But what VTS allows us to do is use what we already recognize and know to puzzle through to what we don't. And we can um, use what we can do to build to what's hard. Yeah, so we don't know how to solve something, but we know where to start. Together, collectively, we can solve the problem. But the fact is, when art is a part of the equation, it's not just um, the thinking that's the issue. It's the feelings that are there as well. So it can become a whole brain activity. <laughs> so it involves the whole sort of thing. I, you know, as I say, I, th I believe it is when the ideas meet emotions that we begin to feed our spirits. You know, it's sort of an interesting thing to think about, the multitude of environments where that could happen, not just in the museum where you have the opportunity to engage with works of art, but it can be in every classroom where you're every day giving kids that opportunity to sort of be who they are in the deepest way. Would you like to join me for a little, I think just a little bit of conversation. Um, one of the reasons I feel responsible to at least have a little Q&A with Philip before we open it up is that we were able to gather some questions um, online through social media and, and an internet site um, that people wanted to ask from Kansas City to New Zealand. And so I wanted to ask at least a couple of those questions. Um, but thank you so much, Philip, for sharing I'm so sorry, I took it longer than I should have. No, that's OK. I'll make sure that you get punished later or that you have something taken away from you. So, <laughs> um, so I have a lot, but I, there were a couple that I thought I was thinking of when you were talking. And one um, directly connects to what you had just mentioned right here at the bottom of the slide um, about it's just not about the thinking skills. And I remember back when I went a couple years ago to the National Council of Teachers of, uh, Teachers of English conference in Las Vegas. And there was a big session, a room filled about this large, filled with teachers. And they were trying to come up with sort of what they needed most or what they wanted to get, what they wanted to develop and find in their students the most. And the thing that rose to the top more than anything else was empathy. And one of the questions that came up about VTS, and it, it kind of connects to the listening that, be, that can be developed within students through VTS, but then you were talking a little bit about these feelings and the sort of affective or emotional side of learning. And I'm wondering if you've seen students develop empathy or skills that, that are geared towards that. Well, you know, it's an interesting thing. It's sort of empathy can't be taught. It can only be learned, which of course is true of practically everything. You can't teach people to listen. Listen to me, doesn't work. It's sort of, you can only teach listening by listening by convincing people that there's worth in it. Same with empathy. There, you, you, if you give people the opportunity to understand and think about someone, what someone else is saying, someone else thinks, someone else feels, you can give the, create an arena in which something like empathy can develop. I mean, it is a huge problem in our culture that we do not have enough empathy for one another. There's no question about that. And it certainly plagues a lot of middle schools, for example, of sort of people be refusing to sort of see someone else's point of view. When you've had since, let's say, beginning in pre-K or even just fifth grade, sort of the notion of, well, let's think about this together. Let's listen to each other. And the teacher's showing us how to do that. I think you have you create the, the environment that nurtures the possibility. You have an environment that it nurtures the, the reasons for listening, that nurtures thinking. You can't make someone think either. You can't teach thinking per se. You just have to give people the opportunity. That's one of the reasons for the restraint with VTS. You don't put in your own ideas. You don't correct. Because you're trying to teach people the, 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 the exercise of their own minds, their own observations, supplying their own evidence to back up. Yes, you've provided a structure. That's what education does. That's what parenting, good parenting, any kind of parenting does. It provides a structure, hoping something would hap will happen. But the happening has to happen in the kids. So um, I do believe that this is a way to teach empathy. And it has sometimes been used in, um, in contexts where, uh, like, for example, Days of Dialogue in LA, which were set up 10 years after the riots, um, the Rodney King uh, riots. Um, they, they, the, the, the wounds were still very, very deep in the communities, sort of between 
the, um, the black residents of the community and the store owners who were mostly Korean kind of thing. They've not learned to talk to each other. So they're, people were sort of trying to concern to bring them in the same room and BTS was used to try to get them to look at things that they didn't think were about them, but of course they were, because everything is. Um, that, they, that they were talking about them, not about themselves, but of course they're talking about themselves, because you always are. Um, in a context where people are listening to each other, because the teacher is, because the subject is actually interesting, and, um, and as, a, as a tool for mending exactly that, trying to bridge that gap that is, that is what the lack of empathy actually is. Well, and I think it's interesting when, um, because one of the questions I do want to get to, but I don't want to jump to it too fast, because it, it comes from, I think, some misunderstandings of visual thinking strategies, but it's that, that it has a lack of information is one of the comments that, that commonly comes out as a critique against VTS um, and visual thinking strategies. But whenever I see, like today, or you know, anytime VTS used, there's so much information that's just coming from a different source. Um, and I think that can often lead to you know, listening to each other because it's not you standing here giving us information, which I think is the way we typically think of information being brought into a context, but instead it's all of the learners bringing their prior experiences, bringing their lives, and you, you know, mentioned these, these sort of mending experiences. People literally bring their lives to these experiences with art and start to use that as a chance to share together a little bit? Well, people who think that VTS doesn't um, engage in information have a very, very narrow definition of what uh, information is, because what it does very importantly is deal with the information that's in the picture as seen by the people who are looking at it, who are, after all, the beholders. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter what the expert sees in it, or even what Cole Scott saw in it. it um, the artist, sort of, it's, it's about, about what people find, that information is dealt with very fairly and very richly and in great detail, it seems to me. What also can happen with a group is that information of another sort, for example, that's a Matisse in the background, or I, that's Robert Colescott, and I know it's Robert Colescott because I've studied him. Kind of so the information can come in, but it comes in instead of being this, um, something that the teacher reveals, the authority figure kind of thing, it's something that comes, emerges out of the group, and that says, a great deal about where information comes from, which means from each of us. And it's from someone who went to the trouble <laughs> of learning about Cole Scott. Um, instead of the teacher just sort of giving it out as if it were you know, their God-given right. When a teacher in VTS actually does say anything in response to the question like, who made this? You're not disallowed from saying it. If you were in a museum, you can sort of say, how do we find that out? Because you can go to the label. But with a slide, it's a little bit harder than that. And, um, but what you're, what you're allowed to do is sort of say, well, this is by a, an artist named Robert Colescott, and the reason I know that is <laughs> so that you're constantly revealing how information, how knowledge is gained. You're not just acting as if, well, I know. Well, and in, um, in Eugene at the University of Oregon a couple days ago when you were speaking, there was someone with a significant art historical knowledge in the audience, and um, it was interesting. Every time that person brought in historical facts, you would kind of paraphrase them in a way to say, it is thought that, you know, that, that is something that about this work of art, or, and it's interesting to kind of think that's still one scholarly perspective, one sort of voice, and I know many other, um, you know, sort of uh, veteran museum educators, people that are really influencing the field these days are really about information opening up multiple perspectives as opposed to saying, no, it's actually this that we're talking about. Um, but so we can, uh, one of the things that actually complicates VTS for me is we can be in a room like this and look at a Cole Scott and see, you know, we can, we have the visual vocabulary to see Matisse or maybe to understand a little bit what's going on in that work of art. Um, but what if we really spent that time with uh, an African sculpture, a ritual object, um, and no one in this room had things to bring to that, a, 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 that sort of cultural background. I'm curious about how, objects that are outside of the learning, you know, the participants' cultural understanding. Um, that's often one of those conversations where people say, well, VTS fails there because people don't bring, you know, that Southeast Asian context to that Buddhist statue. And so if students in a second grade classroom are talking about it um, and never get to that, then they're missing the point. And I'm, you know, I'm bringing that out because I think when you started, you brought up a lot of slides that had these objects with these really interesting cultural and spiritual and community contexts. But 
we only maybe know that because of learning about those objects. And I know, I mean, sort of, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. It's sort of, in other words, when people are at the beginning of your viewing life, let's say the kids are at the beginning of their reading life, who do you give them to read? Joyce? <laughs> you think about it. You give them something that's sort of, you know, tailored to their interests as well as their ability and so on and so forth. You look even at the weight of the book, the size of the type, you make all sorts of decisions about what it is you want to do to sort of help them learn how to do something. And that doesn't restrict them in the end from appreciating, you know, a T.S. Eliot. It just puts them in the path toward it. So you don't, I would not give them a, I mean, if I were giving, if I, when I do use African art, let's say, in something, it would be the kind that is on that slide of that mother and child because there's so much there that does give you stuff to go on that's not disrespectful and wouldn't end up being disrespectful to the culture. It's what, what's, what BTS does is put things in, in the, um, it teaches the basis of making sense out of things visual, no matter how, that are, and, and <laughs> from the standpoint of having enough that's recognizable that gives you a chance to get it, and enough that's puzzling to give you something that makes it worth you staying with it for a while. And um, the, when, when selecting images, I'm determined to find ones that people are going to mostly get right. Because in the, sense, in the end, if you were trying to sort of talk about a Afri work of African art and you didn't know anything about it, or Native American art, or you know, Islamic art, and you, you felt deficient in it kind of thing, it's, not a, it's no fun. So I'm always looking for those things that actually do connect with my audience in a very deep, juicy, I call it, way sort of thing, and saving those other things for the moment when, when number one, their viewing skills are at a point where they realize it's not everything, you know, I'm not the be all and end all of it. Um, I, you know, I can look at something and puzzle over this, but then become curious and look for the answers to the rest of it. So, so yes, you can't take someone who knows nothing about African art or rocket science and expect them to have a good conversation about it. So you're just, you're just sensitive to what it is both they can do and are interested in doing, and that's very key, that e interest piece. Yeah, you know, so in the museum context, I think, I'm interested in, in your experiences both in the classroom leading these types of, of exercises or observing a lot, um, and also in the museum. I feel like one of the, one of the things that I've seen in some um, museum uses of it is, you know, in the classroom, and, and the teachers that are here know, it's not as if you, students walk into the classroom, you VTS a work of art, and then they leave. I mean, it's part of, like you said, it's part of this sort of whole learning. Um, it's part of you know, embedded in lesson plans, social studies, all kinds of other things. But for some reason, museums have these VTS moments not often not embedded in anything. It's just... It's, they stand alone by themselves with a series of different works of art, whereas museums somehow don't have the freedom to say, the VTS will do incredible things, but we can actually, you talked about bringing sources and bringing primary sources and texts and really making it a full experience. And um, I think it's rarely happening in museums and, and Well, people. except the ones who run partnerships with schools so yeah. that you have, uh, you have the, the sort of one, the one kind of learning going on in the classroom and the kids come prepared for because of that, for a different kind of enricher sort of experience at the museum. Um, so you can, you can <laughs> effectively use classrooms as to, as, your, as to do their part of the job. And in fact, what's wonderful about BTS, as far as I'm concerned, is that sort of, hey, Deb, how, did you, how much did you know about art before you got BTS? <laughs> so, so there's, you know, Jeff. But so we have someone who didn't and someone who does. The fact is that both teachers can use it as because there's a place for them to start too. It's sort of it's a it's a it's a tool that doesn't mean that you have to know anything about art to integrate it deeply into your classroom and sort of to learn. I mean, just to give 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 your kids the benefit of it, no matter what the, what you think of it. You're giving your kids the opportunity to dig in this stuff. So. But the thing is, for me, in museums, if you're giving people a rich experience in looking and finding meaning, which is different from um, the, 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 the rich experience that can come from listening to someone else's insights into it, you're giving them, I think, the right idea about how museums are supposed to be used. Museums 
do their very best to collect the best art they can and present it in the most beautiful way possible, often out of context kind of thing. It's not as if you, you are teaching all the history of something or so on and so forth. It's often just there and, it, and it's next to something that it wouldn't have been next to in real life kind of thing. So you, you recreate these experiences that are about the aesthetics, the, about the experience of looking kind of thing. And then we think we are, have the obligation to teach about them in, from our historical standpoint with all sorts of information. I think mm, those aren't really working together so well. It's, it's like what we really have a strength at at museums is allowing people to see things easily. And so what we do with VTS is give them a chance to think at them, look at them deeply, <laughs> spend time with them. So it seems to me that sort of VTS is way more in line with what museums are actually good at than lectures about art history. And you mentioned sort of training these self-sufficient viewers, these people that can actually use a museum. And, and the work you did at MoMA, finding out that people were leaving the door and not absorbing really anything. They were happy, a, but they yeah. were dumb. No. <laughs> <laughs> no but, um, yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, but they, but we hadn't helped them in any kind of significant way, you know. So what's, you know, it's like that leading people to you can feed them, or you can teach them to fish. You know, it's sort of, what's the deal? Yeah, and I think the same thing might go with might go true with a lot of the teachers that are learning, you know, strategies that like this type of strategy that you can use in a museum. It, it, like you said, we don't we don't want them to rely on us as education staff or even curatorial staff. And we have events here at the museum all the time where people will you know, clamor around one individual to hear them speak, but then they don't leave with very much necessarily. Um, and to try to get museum visitors to understand these are their institutions and they can come to them and learn these skills in looking and, and really utilize the institutions. It really thinks about the community and audience of our institutions much broader than just whoever wants to come and listen to us. Well, and um, when you think about the fact that a third year, third three-year-old can sort of learn everything there is to know about ants by looking you know, just sort of, not everything that there is, but you know what I mean. And uh, adults who feel that they can't figure out what's going on in an image, what has happened? There's a disconnect that between those things that are so richly, of which we are so richly capable when we're young, that we somehow need to be reminded of, we, we need them rehoned, unfortunately. But the fact is that they're, they exist in us just as much as they do in these children. So, you know, that's sort of what, um, I mean, at one point, Abigail and I thought we were teaching viewing skills, but what we were doing is just asking people to use the ones that they make use of all the time. They just don't think about it, how they would apply in this context. I've got one last little question, then I want to open it up to see if there are any other questions. Um, what, have you seen any, I'm going to use a weird word, but any long-term stickiness of VTS. So um, have there been any studies or have you and Abigail um, or you know the Gardner Museum, which is doing a lot of research, seen any long-term really benefits or juiciness to this approach? There was one group um, of kids who we followed through, I think, 10th or 11th grade in Byron, Minnesota. Um, the actual intervention stopped at 8th grade, um, and there was no backsliding. What we have a lot of data about is the fact that sort of um, by doing a pretest and post test at the beginning of, of ex experimental treatment years, um, we uh, we know what what kids are uh, their aesthetic developmental level as well as uh, some other things at the beginning of their third grade at the end of their third grade. But then by interviewing them at the beginning of fourth grade, we know what happened over the summer. <laughs> There's no backsliding there either. And that's something that's really, really interesting because there are very, very few teachers who think that kids haven't lost everything that they learned in third grade over the summer kind of thing, sort of. And so, so it's sort of, and I think that's because it's student-centered, it's developmentally appropriate, it's, um, you know, it's interesting, and it's learnable. You know, you don't have a strategy that has a million questions. You have a strategy that has three. <laughs> and so how long does it take to learn the behaviors implicit in three simple questions, the questions, questions that you would you ask yourself all the time anyway? Like, what's going on here? You walk into a cocktail party, what do you ask? <laughs> yeah, how can I really? get out of here? 
Can we go, dear? <laughs> but, <laughs> Why don't we uh, open it up for a few questions from the audience? Yeah. Well, I don't think anybody is sort of is embracing Common Core without a few trepidations, and they should, of course. It's sort of being rolled out, um, uh, and it, it should have been rolled out in such a way that we sort of say, here we are, we're going to try these, and we're going to revise them next year based on real life experience, and we're going to keep that up for 10 years. Um, they're going to be rolling out tests, and tests make a huge problem, even something that's terrific. No matter how good it is, as soon as you start using standardized tests and standardized scoring, which is even worse than the tests, to uh, understand the validity of it, as soon as you use all that to sort of judge teachers, you're in a mess. You're quite right. And so we, we have a big problem in our culture being so test crazy. We have a big problem in our culture sort of um, not leaving enough to teachers in schools to develop the bright way of teaching for their kids. But that said, it's a better set of standards than we've had for a very, very long time to use as the basis for our thinking about what we want for our kids. And so I agree with you completely, not problem free by any means. But the anchor standards, way more than the standards that go grade by grade, curriculum by area by area, those are problematic. I quite agree with you. They should be a subject of review every year with real life intervene, intervening and, and helping to shape those. If I had anything to do with setting policy, you'd be sure that we would be working in that basis. But I don't. Unfortunately, you don't either. So, <laughs> but collectively, collectively, we could in fact speak out. And if we don't, we're making a big mistake. If we just reject them, I don't know. Because in fact, to teach kids to think, to teach them to be able to read deeply across curriculum areas, that's not a problem. That's a good thing. That's a very good thing. And, I, and I've seen <laughs> their second graders beginning to do that. Not just beginning. They've made a substantial step in that direction. It can be done. But the thing is that sort of as long as we are test crazy, you know, the whole thing is really nuts at this age. Like, who really needs to know how well you're doing? The kid. The kid needs to know, needs to be able to assess where I stand, what I've learned, what I haven't learned, What's left for me to learn? And they're the last one in the equation with all that stupid testing that goes on. It's all about trying to tell politicians how well teachers have done. I mean, yes, we have things backwards. <laughs> it, all assessment should be really focused on the kid understanding how the kid is doing. And almost none of it is there. So to say we have no problems, mm -mm. But to say that Common Core is, you know, Diane Ravitch isn't completely uh, against it. She's against testing. She's against a lot of things. And she's been in, against and for things. Her judgment needs to be sort of watched from time to time because she even changes her mind, as we all know. No. The push to move out articles are doing first and second grade standards in kindergarten. And so I just, I, I believe kids need art, they need to look at art, they need to do art. I don't think there's anybody here arguing against. So I just had to say that. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. Sort of <laughs> any other questions? <laughs> yes.
right? So I think I'm. So Carmen's gonna dual immersion. It's Spanish and English, and our dual is like fifty percent of the day in Spanish and fifty percent of the day in English. And our teachers are gonna be doing questions in Spanish right now. Yes. Okay. And so the question is. Well, some of the students in other schools where they have. Oh. Well, you know, I, this is um, not my expertise, but I have um, con consistently heard since the beginning days of BTS that e English um, ELL teachers have found it to be unbelievably helpful in, try in, 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 in pushing ahead the language development. Um, it, the fact that it's conversation about things that are sort of, you know, kind of grounded in images, the fact that there is an image to ground vocabulary, uh, because the, um, the situations seem real to them. It seems like an authentic way to use language instead of something like an exercise. Um, it's, if you choose the pictures correctly, it's language that they need to negotiate or life or to understand what's going on kind of thing. I mean, it just feels authentic in a, in a very sort of real way. So, I don't know why it works so well. I suspect there are other people in this room who do, um, but the, yeah, for example. Um, but, um, but the fact is that sort of, it's been a very powerful tool for helping to develop language. But you know, the thing is that sort of, I think kids throughout elementary school, perhaps through high school, maybe through college kind of thing, are still developing language. Maybe we all are even now as grownups. So to think about sort of language instruction as sort of being, adequate at a particular time, when is that time kind of thing. And the whole notion of sort of giving people complex problems to discuss is an enormously important aspect of developing language. We, we think about language development mostly in terms of reading and writing, but oral language is, uh, you know, it's what we do most of kind of thing. And one of the things that I've learned over the course of BTS, and it seems like a duh once you say it, is that oral language comes first. If you can't say it, you probably can't write it. And you probably can't read it. On the other hand, if you can, you probably can write it. And you probably can read it. And I think, but sort of it's been, we, we, we minimize open-ended discussion of complexity in life, at home, at dinner, at school, to such a degree that we're not using that incredibly important tool of language development anywhere near enough. We're jumping to writing, we're jumping to reading without that intermediary piece, which is absolutely critical to the process. And you know, kids who come out of poverty are having less opportunity to, to talk about things at home than others. Kids who have one language at home and another language at school have less opportunity to use the language, that, you know, the dominant language, usually. And as a consequence, it sort of, um, they struggle. But it's so fast to give them the opportunity to discuss things. Peer interactions are such a powerful way to learn. Such a powerful way to learn. There, there is no, no, is, there's no, nothing that speeds learning more quickly than putting kids to the problem together, to a problem together. So then when they're, when they, when they're kids, when kids are trying to find the language to talk about things, they're doing it at their own levels. And when you paraphrase what they say, you're, you're staying with that level. You're, you may, in fact, up the ante by making it grammatically correct, by giving a, a, a vocabulary word that they're looking for, but it's within reach. It's, it's within reach. It's what they can learn. It's what they want to learn. And so, you know, sort of, so there are lots of pieces to this that are sort of really quite incredible. Now, did we know this when we started? No. We learned it all from teachers. We learned it all from watching what teachers do and listening to them and, and just asking for more kind of thing. So, you know, you, you all are our lab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right here. And then we'll go back there. My understanding is that BTS is not in very many schools. Is that correct? It's not in very many? That's true. It's not in enough.
Well, sharing it, sort of bringing it to other people's attention. And there's, you know, our website has lots of tapes and shows it at different age levels and has lots of background information and all that kind of stuff. It actually has lesson plans so that you can really know how to do it, really. Um, so that, um, although we do recommend that people go through training because it just, it honestly helps. But the, the interesting thing is that when a school does it, on the, on the school basis, not only do all kids get it, and not only do they get it in a sequential basis, which means that you have the opportunity to build on earlier experience kind of thing, but the process of learning it creates teams of teachers working together in ways that, first of all, Common Core wanted in its original configuration, sort of. It wasn't supposed to be sort of, you know, top down from publishers and tested in that same way. It was supposed to be sort of teachers developing their own curriculum. That was one of the things that they sort of put out there. But in any case, teachers through VTS, learning VTS together, often have a way of talking about teaching with each other and, and of building these math lessons, these science lessons, together kind of thing that, that creates the environment where sort of v, where Common Core becomes a little more easy to um, predict as being successful but also being useful kind of thing. But in any case, we do, we do recommend that schools take it on wholly. And, but I th you know, what's interesting is unless you have, you know, there are principles that are you know, impossible, but, um, but if teachers come to principles with sort of something that they want to do, it's pretty hard for those without, with hearts not to sort of take heart and think, you know, maybe we should give this a look kind of thing, and there's lots of ways in which VTS can be presented. We have two incredible trainers here in Portland who are willing to come to your school and present to teachers and to um, administrators separately, together, whatever kind of thing. And so, and they're sitting in the front row, and it's Kim Aziz, do you mind my? Yeah. Kim Aziz and, and Mirka, Jablonski, jeez. <laughs> Someone with the last name of the other one shouldn't blow it. <laughs> um, anyway, so, but there, you know, come up front and introduce yourself. Yeah, there's one question, there's one in the middle here, and I think we might be unfortunately out of time, but afterwards, feel free to come up, and I think Philip probably has a little bit of time after that to answer some questions too. So, sir, right in the middle. I think it's a few. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good, so in terms of museums that, you know, things that we can do for just, to, you're not here on a VTS tour. How do we develop your viewing skills? Um, it's something that I think art museums are trying to think a lot more about these days. I think, um, unfortunately, I think museums, and Philip has been in them a lot longer than I am, but I think the work that Philip did was to try to help get museums out of this sort of um, art historical rut, which is that they're places where you learn the sort of art historical narrative. And people still, when they come to works of art, I think the research is they spend a lot more time looking at labels and reading labels than they do looking at the works of art. Um, and so I think through education programs, through, you know, through working with docent volunteers that lead not just school tours, but adult tours and public tours each day at the museum, um, and trying to open up those viewing opportunities as many times as possible. We had a slow art day here at the museum where it was really focused around just slowing down and anyone could sign up for that and come to that day um, and trying to really think about that experience we have with art um, and, um, and offering programs. But I think there's a lot more that museums can do to really think about those, taking those viewing experiences that Philip talks about there we're born with um, and bringing them to the museums and trying to make a museum a much more comfortable place to be in. Um, not necessarily, I mean, I, I write, read all the time when people say they come up to a work of art like a Mark Rothko and they think, well, I don't get it. Something must be broken in me. Like, I don't know enough about it. Um, and I think um, continuing to try to push and work on everything that we do at the museum to make sure people know that 
that you can trust your process of looking and seeing and experiencing the work of art. And often if you just stop and spend more time with it. I feel like I, I, one of my favorite works of art to work on is uh, modern and contemporary art because those are the ones that people often dismiss rapidly and walk by. Um, and like when the Francis Bacon painting was here, you know, people would talk a lot about auction value um, and maybe make some side comments, but they wouldn't spend a lot of time with it necessarily. And so trying to get people to spend a little bit more time with work is something I think museums are still you know, challenged with. Um, but they've been challenged with that for 50 years. It's an interesting thing, you know. Um, you know, it's sort of, well, I, I could go on with that, but the fact is that sort of um, what I think we need, and, and I think this is, I think teachers need to do a little bit more talking back and saying, you know what, <laughs> this has got to be a dialogue. And, um, you know, I, I, I think the unions could be more effective at doing that instead of just sort of fighting. I don't know, but somehow the media could be harnessed by teachers to sort of say, yes, but kind of thing. But I think the same thing is true of the museum public. It's sort of, there are people who want the museums to be more responsive, but they mostly don't tell us. You know, they mostly don't sort of say, you know, I'm not gonna come, I'm not gonna give you money until I feel more, like more of my neighbors are welcome here. And, um, you know, I, I one time thought, this is really weird, but I, you know, I raised you know, X number of thousands and tens of millions, lots and lots of money <laughs> to, to, to develop school programs since working in the late, you know, when I went to work at the Metropolitan Museum in the late 60s. Um, high sc school programs, in that case, high school programs, were supposed to sort of develop the new audience for the museum, a more broad audience, an audience that more directly reflected the demographics of our cities. Now, I sort of think, of, I think about this in terms of this way, sort of if investment capitalists had given me the money to develop those programs to develop a new audience, I think they might have stopped giving money by now. Sort of, so it's an interesting thing, sort of we're, we're, we're not accomplishing what we need to do, and, but, we, but we need a constituency that says, asks for it. I think the people who created Common Core need teachers to tell us. I think Prentice needs to hear, I mean, I don't mean Prentice, I mean Pearson sort of needs to hear from teachers. It sort of, does that make any sense to you? Sir? Amy, did you want to yeah, add something? Well, you know, <laughs> I think you're going to recognize this opinion when I sort of say it. Why not do VTS? Why do something else? When actually, when we've done the research that sort of says that this actually works. No, I don't say that you know, sort of it should be the exclusive thing. That's not what you said, though. <laughs> um, the fact is. Well, okay, but is, as a teaching strategy, BTS has a lot of research behind it. Kinesthetic education doesn't. Is that a reason not to do it? No, but it's not a reason to count on it. It's not a reason any more than giving art history uh, or strategies as we were doing at MoMA um, was a reason for continuing to do it when we found out it didn't work. I mean, I do think that um, when I, you know, I began my career using movement, using dance, I'm using poetry writing, using theater games with high school students to try to engage them. And why did I abandon that? Because they couldn't use those strategies anywhere else. We, when people ask me, does it stick? I could in no way prove that. 
I was thinking, you know, that um, it's like, you know, all of a sudden uh, the kids that we've worked with with poetry and, and dance show up at the Museum of Modern Art. Are they going to start boogieing? You know, it's like they're not going to get away with it kind of thing. It's not so. I think that the whole process of learning to look is so key. And connecting that to language is so key. Because I do believe Vygotsky. I believe actually both Arnheim and Vygotsky. I think all learning begins with observations, that your mind processes, and that you know you, what you know when you can connect it to language. And, and Vygotsky says ideas are born in language. He doesn't say exactly that, but that's what he's quoted as saying. And he sort of, the relationship between language and knowing is very, very critical. The, language, the relationship between language, I mean, I'm talking about not movement language, I'm talking about words, um, and our feeling confident about something, and our ability to share it with other people, and our ability to expand on it, and to learn more. You know, how does someone who has sort of explored a painting or a sculpture sort of kinesthetically, what are they going to do when they get home and want to know more about that work of art? I've never seen that. You've never seen that. Oh, there is. I didn't say that, but I just mean it, it's a great place to start, and I've never seen it fail. I, kids have plenty to say, but so do grown-ups. Right. Well, the one thing I would jump in with, because I think one of the reasons I think I value a museum that doesn't take an approach, I really like art museums that don't go in one direction. Even museums that are taking the BTS approach are really advanced, playing with it, and they're doing like meta, you know, sort of they'll give students the questions and they'll do different strategies with it, which I think is really interesting. Um, but I do think there is that that VTS does, it's, it's a strategy that I'll, I'm not a, an expert in VTS, but I'll fall back on it or use it as sort of that core opening strategy. But then I really do feel, and I think museums and, and art education really needs to do a lot more research on embodied learning, because I really do feel like there's um, something going on. Um, I think there's definitely something going on with body learning, but I'm not sure it's about art. But in any case, I'm a purist. That's my job. <laughs> it's not necessarily yours. Yes. I just had a question about um, Gem and Khan to the museum and whether you think it would be helpful to curate a selection of art to be, I think, would be good if you had a first grader or a six year old, seven year old, if you as a family went to the museum to say, here's where they are. Um, and, you know, just at each age, like, so a parent coming in would say, okay, these would be good to look at with my child. I would love that, if, that if, they're, if, if um, the idea of being able to give different ages and stages um, looking opportunities that sort of where they could discuss as families or multi-age groups or you know, whatever, um, you know, sort of and feel comfortable doing it, I think they would make a really, really you know, user-friendly museum and it would be very interesting to see what in impact that would have. On, on stuff like that sort of, but it's hard to get that through to curatorial people. But that said, y yeah, sure it. Everything is up all the time. Like at least if you had like 10 things, they could pick four, you know, and they might be there. I mean, you know. <laughs> well, it's, 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 But we do with slides. Right, you do with slides. But, it, but it, you know, there's another way to sort of do it. There could be a list, yeah. uh, you know, that you get can pick up at the desk, sort of that sort of yeah. where these are these are really probably going to be great for kids in this you know age range, and these are going to be big. 
So well, museums have used the research, the you know, the research that that Philip and Abigail Hausen have done to think about label writing, to think about. There was a museum in Cincinnati that commissioned artists to create pieces that were thinking about the developmental stages of who was actually going to look at those works of art. Um, so I think it's been interesting to see how museums. There was a curator at a museum, I think, in Florida, who was actually thinking about how to curate um, after learning and going to a work, an institutional-wide workshop. At, um, that VTS or VUE had led for that institution. I can't remember the museum. Well, the Davis Museum had um, reinstalled its permanent collection at Wellesley College based on Hausen. And then, but the Detroit Institute of Art has one of the most wonderful sets of exhibitions, almost entirely based on, on the issues of that the, the, they, they realized were the public's issues with regard to Hausen. Hausen's data to sort of try to understand how to install art. And, and it is, it is a go at some point. I mean, I know, Detroit, but do it. <laughs> the, the Detroit Institute of Art has a huge, wonderful collection, but they've installed much of it in such interesting ways that it's so engaging. It's so much fun. Well, I think I'm going to go ahead. We've, I, I thank Philip so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Well, and, um, and I, I thank you for being in, for inviting me, kind of thing, and letting me be my feisty self. And I think you know, very I, generous. And, and we'll have a glass of wine and continue to agree to disagree on some <laughs> things. But um, but I always think it's healthy to have these conversations um, and to make sure there's not one way of thinking, one approach. We're partnering with VTS, even though we're not a VTS museum. I think that's so important. The teachers that are teaching this in the schools are doing amazing things, and there's no reason this institution should say well, we're doing it a different way. So we embrace it, and I think it's part of, it's part of many things that we do here, which is, makes this institution richer. It makes the reason I'm here, I think. Um, so thank you, and thank you to everybody who came. Thank you to the teachers that are here. For those of you that, um, on your way out, didn't grab one of those sheets that the VTS organization created, it gives you more information about upcoming events if you're interested. Also highlights a lot of the teachers that Philip writes about in his book that are here in Portland doing amazing work. Some of them are sitting right here. So again, thank you to Philip. It was a great, Always a pleasure to have you, so. Thank you. Thank you.